project founder, she'll address the lack of access to healthy foods and the exploitation of workers and farmed animals. FEP works in solidarity with farm workers, advocates for chocolate not sourced from the worst forms of child labor, and focuses on access to healthy foods in communities of color and low-income communities. She persuaded Trader Joe's to stop selling duck meat and was the spark that got co-founder of Whole Foods Market to become a vegan. Please welcome Lauren O'Neill. <laughs> Hello everybody, thanks for coming to this talk. As always, I know my talks are a little bit different than what most people are used to at these events. So I thank you for um, caring about um, these issues and how many of them are combined. Last year there was a clock, this year I don't see a clock anywhere. So I'm gonna do my best to, to stay on, on track of time, but feel free to be like, hey, you're going too long. So uh, I'm Lauren Ellis, I've been a longtime animal activist. I actually went um, vegetarian when I was in elementary school when my mom told me where chicken came from. Um, I'm from Texas, so you can imagine how well that went over. Uh, this was also in the 70s. So I didn't go vegan until I was in high school in the late 80s. Again, not the most popular thing to do in Texas. Um, but I did this um, because I, there was so much suffering going on in the world. And I saw that one way I could try and eliminate some of the suffering in the world was to stop consuming animals. I also was involved in other social justice issues at the time, um, some of which I'll talk about um, right now. Um, so Food Empowerment Project, we're a, a nonprofit organization based in Sonoma County. Our work is local as well as national and to some degree international as well. But our work is really working to connect the issues of oppression, to show that all of these issues that impact the most vulnerable in the food supply is connected and that we have the power with our food choices as individuals as well as using our collective voices to help create positive change. And I just want to give a shout out again to Greg and Patley and everybody who organized this festival for once again allowing um, our voice to be heard at, a conference, at an event such as this. Um, our work is not strictly just focused on non-human animals. And so it's a rare breed of vegans and activists who understand these connections. So my goal today is to talk about food as a tool for change. And I know that many people may realize this, but don't um, put much thought into it as they're purchasing food. And the reason why this issue is really important to me is because it's really why I started Food Empowerment Project. History is strewn with examples of how individuals have used food as a tool to create change. And that's what I'm going to talk a little bit about. And when you talk about this, you have to, it's important to me for us to acknowledge that tool has been used as a change for bad as well. Um, with the Indigenous Day coming up on Monday, which some people call Columbus Day, it's an important time to recognize what colonization did to the lives of many people around the globe, many indigenous people. I'm a Chicana, which means I'm a very proud Mexican. Um, and there's no denying the impacts of what Columbus had on the lives of the indigenous people in Mexico when he landed um, so forcefully and uh, aggressively on our lands. Um, at the time, it was primarily the Mayas and the Aztecs who were living in Latin America at this time, who were eating primarily beans, pumpkins, tomatoes, other type of plant-based foods. Not to say that they weren't eating any animal products. There were some native turkeys who were there. There were also eggs of other birds they could eat. eat. But for the most part, they were eating plant-based foods. But what happened is, is when the Europeans and the Spanish came over, they saw that food as substandard. They had concerns that if they ate this food, they would put, become inferior because they saw the indigenous people as an inferior peoples. So Columbus, on his second voyage in 1493, actually brought horses, dogs, pigs, cows, sheep, and goats with him. Because this is what the Europeans and the Sp Spaniards were more used to con consuming, were these products. And when you look at society today, you can see remnants of how this has impacted many of us. 
Many of us are what Food Empowerment Project calls lactose normal, which means we do not digest the milk of another species into adulthood. It doesn't work well with our bodies, right? Too many times the onus is put on people of color that there's something wrong with us because we can't digest milk or we can't digest lactose, when in reality, that's a part of colonization that brought those foods to our lives. So, again, this is a time when food was used as a force for change, a negative change that completely devastated um, how many people of color um, around the globe eat today and why many of us um, have problems with things such as cow's milk. But really, again, when you think about it, cow's milk is for a baby calf. You can also look back in England in 1791 when Parliament rejected an abolitionist bill against slavery. During this time, women were not allowed the right to vote, but many women were opposed to slavery, but they couldn't vote on anything in the country. So they did what they, what they could do, and they used their food as a tool for change. They started the boycott against sugar, and rum to a lesser extent to boycott slavery that was happening in the West Indies. In 1792, 400,000 people in England were boycotting sugar because they didn't want to be a part of the slave trade that was taking place in the West Indies. By 1820s, a lot of the um, colonies, they started pushing then because they got it passed in England and they started to push then for all the British colonies as well to stop being invested in the slave trade that was taking place. And again, it's not as if this stopped what was happening, but it was a way that women could use another tool, another way other than voting. And for me, I look at this, and trust me, I'm not a historian and I'm not trying to act like one, as much as that this has made an impact on myself as an advocate to recognize different ways that we can have change because I, as I believe strongly in voting, I know that my vote doesn't always make a difference, but I do recognize these things that we can do, these other ways that on a daily basis that we can make sure that we're trying to affect positive change. So although maybe this didn't create the change to abolish slavery, it was a tool that was used and an important tool to use food to create positive change. In the United States, we have examples as well. Um, my mom raised me um, to support the grape boycott that was taking place in the United States. And for those of you who aren't familiar with the grape boycott, it was started by Filipino activists as well as Latinx activists um, against Delano, um, grape growers in Delano who were taking away the rights of farm workers. They were preventing them from being able to unionize and demand things such as better wages, better living conditions, better working conditions. Um, it was ended up what helped to start the United Farm Workers, which is co-founded by Dolores Huerta as well as Cesar Chavez. Um, Cesar Chavez was a vegan for ethical reasons, for the sake of the animals. But the Great Boycott was used um, through, from 1965 to 1970 to galvanize people, not only in the United States, but around the world, to recognize the plight of farm workers in this country and the horrific ways in which, I w could say, in which they were being treated, but I have to acknowledge in which they still continue to be treated, where a lot of their rights are not, their lives are not their own in terms of the fact that where they're forced to live, where they're forced to work and the conditions in which they live in are absolutely um, inhumane. Now, in 1973, the Delano growers signed a contract with the union workers and they were able to um, have a union where the workers would make decisions for themselves on how they wanted um, wages, what rights that they wanted. But unfortunately, a lot of that changed when Ronald Reagan became governor here in California. Um, so they started another great boycott in the late 1980s through to 2000s where they started to uh, talk about things like agricultural chemicals um, that, were, that the workers were being exposed to, how many of these workers had children who were born with birth defects. So they were trying to encourage people to use grapes, use this focal point of a grape to encourage the public to be aware, to inform the public about what was happening to farm workers, but also to put that economic pressure because as we know, a lot of times corporations aren't going to be making changes because they believe in justice and because they believe in what's right for people. They're only going to make changes when there's an economic impact and their pocketbooks are being affected. 
So they, they stopped the great boycott in the 2000s. Now, I didn't learn about the great boycott ending until 2002. So most of my life, I didn't eat grapes, I didn't eat raisins, I didn't drink wine, and I didn't even drink grape soda. So you can all eat grapes. Um, I wouldn't say that anything's changed drastically for the farm workers, which I'll go into, but the UFW decided to change this. Another important tool for change that I like to look at is the free breakfast po uh, program started by the Black Panther Party. Um, the Black Panther Party had, um, which I've written about in the blog because we've worked with um, some of the founding members, they had their own principles of change, which included um, things such as a lot of things that we're dealing right, right now with the Black Lives Matter movement, where you have a right to not be brutalized by police officers, where people have a right to healthy foods. Um, but included in this, um, the Black Panther Party started what was the free breakfast program, which they started in Oakland um, at St. Augustine Church. And what they recognized, which, you know, isn't really, it's amazing, the Black Panther Party started this movement, um, and they were the ones to make this um, a reality for school children across the United States today. But they started the free breakfast program knowing that children going into schools are going to do better on a full stomach than if they're hungry. Um, and I'm somebody who grow, grew up in somewhat of a not exactly food um, wealthy <laughs> area. My mom raised myself and my sisters by herself. Um, so we didn't always have food. So I know what it was like to go to school and not wanting your stomach to growl and other people to hear it and be more concerned with being hungry than concentrating on the lessons um, that you were supposed to take in. So the Black Panther Party started this program where they ended up feeding on a daily basis over 10,000 school children across the United States a free breakfast. Again, recognizing success for them is education and by being able to have healthy food in the morning was going to impact and have a positive impact on their life. This is why today there is a free school lunch program in the United States is because of the Black Panther Party. So my point with that was, again, to recognize they solved food as a tool for change. We have it again in South Africa, um, and this is one of the movements I was working on when I was in high school, um, and I'm not going to pretend like, I'm sorry, I jumped over. I jumped over the Coors boycott. Um, basically, in the 1980s, late 70s, Coors, the beer company, was known for a lot of racist tactics as well as homophobic tactics to not hire people who were gay or people who were Mexicans. And so an incredible campaign got started against Coors Beer, recognizing these and, and all these activist organizations banded together and created a strong boycott against Bo uh, Coors Beer Company. Um, and through, they wouldn't even give um, they also had a thing against women, which is kind of sounding like a presidential candidate right now to me. But um, they had a thing against Mexicans, gays, and women, um, and they wouldn't even have uh, allow the women to have restroom breaks um, at work at Coors. This again, this was in the past. So all these groups got together and they recognized if they started a campaign against Coors, a boycott, getting people again to recognize the power that their food choices can have, they could create change within Coors, and they did. Now, I'm not gonna come up here and act like I know that Coors is a great company or anything, because I don't, but what I do know is that they, my understanding is they actually have commercials now featuring um, uh, same-sex couples. So maybe they're trying to show that they're not as horrible as they used to be, but this was a successful campaign that was run. Okay. Now getting back to the anti-apartheid movement, which I was involved in, um, working on when I was in high school. And although a lot, so for those of you who don't know what apartheid was in South Africa, and it's an incredible part of history and a painful part of history that I think everybody needs to be aware of. I gave a talk at San Francisco State a couple years ago, and most of the students didn't know um, what, was, what happened in South Africa. I'm hoping um, that the good thing about Nelson Mandela passing away is that more people are now aware of what was happening in South Africa. It was started after World War II, um, where basically the racist, discriminatory regime, I can't, it's so hard for me to talk about because it's so unbelievable, but basically 
they started segregating the population in South Africa between the whites and the blacks. And although the black people, the majority in South Africa, they took away all of their rights. And this was going on since the 1940s, which is um, when Nelson Mandela started working on a lot of this. Um, if you don't know who Steve Biko is, he's an incredible hero of mine, and I encourage everybody to learn about Steve Biko. Um, a quick lesson on who Steve Biko was and what he's done, what he did during the anti-apartheid movement is actually in a film called Cry Freedom um, featuring Denzel Washington. But the apartheid movement was horrible what was taking place and what pe activists around the country were trying to do was to get corporations to divest from South Africa, meaning remove your businesses from South Africa while this racist regime is taking place. And for many of us, like myself, I was in high school, and so what could I actually do? So one of the tools they had was encouraging people to boycott some of these companies that were refusing to leave South Africa, which basically means they were willing to profit from the racist regime that was taking place in South Africa. So they called a boycott of products such as Coca-Cola. And Coca-Cola refused to ever divest from South Africa, which is why people like me who hold a grudge continue to boycott Coca-Cola. Um, but they would, um, and again, I'm not a historian and I'm not trying to act like I know everything about these issues, but as an activist, this is the stuff that impacted me. But um, eventually, um, all of this um, helped create change for South Africa. Um, luckily, Nelson Mandela finally got out of prison and he was able to lead the country. There's obviously controversy about like that, as there is in every country on leaders. But um, they were able to end apartheid, but that's not to say that things are great in South Africa, just like we can say there's civil rights in this country, and we know it hasn't really done a lot for, for black people or other people of color in this country. But my point, see, I get off track because there's so much politics behind this. But the goal of all of this is to show you how food has been used as a tool for social change. So how many people in this room are vegetarian? How many people in this room are vegans? Okay, so you vegans, like myself, um, hold your hands up again. Okay, so um, you have to keep your hand up. So why are you vegan? Um, I was sort of with the animal aspect, but I'm starting to learn more about the intersectionality. So just know who she Cool. Okay, and you, because I, I already know, I think, who yours. But... Okay. The intersectionality, any kind of oppression. Awesome. Oh my gosh, I love you both so much. It's like I paid you to be here in my talk or something. Um, that's all I wanted to hear. No, okay. Um, so basically, m the reason why many of us are vegan is because we are using a food as a tool for social change, right? We're basically saying that I, well, for me, I'll speak for myself, I love animals, and I'm not ashamed that I absolutely love animals. Some more than others, I admit, sharks and cats, my favorites, two carnivores. Um, but anyway, I love animals, and I'm not ashamed that I look at this as a way for me to not to contribute to their suffering, as me to not support anything that's going to hurt them, right? So I'm using food as a tool for change. Now, that's my individual choice, but the fact that I also talk to other people about vegan, veganism, the fact that maybe some of you know how to cook and you share good vegan food with other people, you're using food as a tool for social change too, right? Because you're trying to encourage other people to stop being invested in a situation that causes harm. And I need to check on my time because I see people rolling about. <gasps> okay. What time do I have, Joel? Is it 1.15? So I need to speed this up. So basically what I'm trying to do is remind us that we are, many of us in this room are already using food as a tool for social change. So what I'm saying is not a big leap as I continue to talk. So. So this is Autumn. She lives at a sanctuary in Vermont. It's called Vine Sanctuary. And for me, Food Empowerment Project, we are a vegan organization. We're a vegan organization for ethical reasons, for the animals, for Autumn. Because we believe that Autumn has a right to her own body. She has a right to not be constantly impregnated in order to produce milk for human animals to consume. And she has a right to be with her baby that she's carried for all this time and has given birth to. And little Maddox here, who's not her baby, by the way, 
Um, but y'all wouldn't know that if I didn't tell you that, but I am an honest person. Maddox has a right to his own life, right? He has a right to be with his mother if he wants to be with his mother. So this is why we're vegan, because of these individual animals and all that they are and all of who they want to be and who have, they have the right to be. I've investigated factory farms and slaughterhouses around the United States, and I'm hoping that I don't know if this is going to work. I can give you some sound, but it may not work. I don't know why it's not showing. It's not letting me do it. All right. I apologize. It came up earlier when we were testing it. Basically, it is an audio of a mom and a baby bellowing back and forth to each other that I took at a small farm in um, Georgia. So again, it <clears throat> doesn't matter how big or small these farms are, they're going to separate the moms from the babies. Just like if they're cage-free eggs or they're free-roaming hen chickens, they're going to endure a lot of pain and suffering. They're all going to be shipped to the same slaughterhouses where these animals are killed. So if you want to eliminate some of the suffering to non-human animals and you have access to healthy foods, veganism is definitely the best way to do it. Again, recognizing that not all people have access to healthy foods, which I'll talk about in a minute as well. So I talked about the great boycott and how that was used as a tool for farm workers. Now, Food Empowerment Project, we also advocate for farm workers today because some of the same abuses that farm workers were experiencing in the 1970s and the 1980s are still going on today. Over 400,000 children are still working in the fields in the United States. You have them living in conditions, um, many without, the roof, without a roof over their head. Many are homeless. Many of them work long hours. Women are sexually harassed in the fields. And many of them, majority of them, don't even have access to the fresh fruits and vegetables they're picking. So one of the current campaigns that's going on that you as consumers can use to help use food as a tool for social justice is the Campaign Against Wendy's, organized by the Coalition of Immokalee Workers. And all they're asking for is for Wendy's to pay the farm workers one more penny per pound for the tomatoes that they pick. One penny per pound. That's all they're asking for. The Immokalee workers who have gotten many corporations such as Whole Foods Market and Trader Joe's to change have seen a profound difference in the lives of the farm workers just by that one penny more per pound that they're getting. So Food Empowerment Project also recently did a school supply drive for the children of farm workers throughout the Bay Area. And if any of you here in the audience donated to that school supply drive, this is my opportunity to thank you from the bottom of my heart for donating the school supplies. Um, I try not to get emotional, but we, we donated um, over 371 backpacks full of school supplies. We're talking about we collected 6,000 pencils if that gives you an idea of how many school supplies we collected. We delivered them to farm workers living in um, Sonoma County, which is where we're based, primarily working in the wine industry. We also donated school supplies to farm workers living in Salinas and Watsonville area who pick our strawberries. These farm workers um, don't get paid a lot. And this is one thing that we look at and we do not as an act of charity, but instead to help right an injustice that's taking place to farm workers. We are thanking them for growing the food that we eat, especially as vegans, because that's all we eat. Unless you grow your own food, this young girl's parents are who's picking the food for you. For those of you who've heard me speak before, and we, I apologize for this graphic, we will be working on it, um, but I've mentioned before um, the 50-mile rule, which forces um, farm workers who live in the labor camps to move 50 miles away from the labor camp when they're not in picking season, which means their children have to be pulled out of school and they're not able to complete their education. On December 9th in Sacramento, we're going to be having a protest against the state agency responsible for this decision. We're asking everybody, if you care about what's happening to farm workers and if you want to do your part to thank them, for picking the food. Remember, these people sacrifice so much for their children. 
That's why they cross the border. That's why the women get on birth control pills before they even cross the border because they know what they're in for. So their children can have a start to a better life. We please ask you to join us on December 9th. December 10th is International Human Rights Day. Education is a human right. And we want their children to succeed, so we want to demand changes of this agency. And we want to show them that they may not be seeing these farm workers. None of us may see these farm workers every day in the fields. But we are going to make sure they're visible on that day, and we demand that they be held accountable for impacting their education. One of the other areas that Food Empowerment Project works on, and we try and we galvanize all of you to help us use this tool of yours to help create change, and that's against the worst forms of child labor, including slavery, that's happening in Western Africa. As I stand here right now, 1.8 million children in Ghana and the Ivory Coast alone are victims of the worst forms of child labor. And what I mean by that is that children are using hazardous equipment such as machetes, some as young as five years old, to cut cacao pods out of the trees. You have children who are beaten if they don't move fast enough. You have other children who are locked in at night to prevent them from escaping. There's a variety of ways these children get into the cacao industry, but know that some of them are stolen from marketplaces. Some of them get into it because they're from very poor countries nearby, such as Burkina Faso and Mali, and their parents believe this is a way their children are going to be able to make some money and send it back to the families, and instead they may never see them again. So we ask everybody, again, when people talk about this chocolate bar being cruelty-free because it's vegan, it's not cruelty-free if it's at the hands of children in Western Africa who are being enslaved for chocolate. It's outrageous that still today, 2016, we have to talk about slavery taking place for such things as a luxury item such as chocolate, but it's happening. Just last June, over 60 children were released from slavery, ages 6 to 16. Released from slavery. Not any other thing, but they were liberated. What got me to care about the chocolate issue is when a former slave was asked, what would you say to Westerners who eat chocolate? And he said, when you eat chocolate, you're eating my flesh. And as a vegan, I thought this is the same thing as a non-human animal would say. There's no way I could look at chocolate in the same way again. So I ask you if you're vegan and you care about humans and you care about social justice issues, We've created a list to help you to buy chocolates that are not sourced from these areas. We make sure that every company makes at least one chocolate that's vegan. They have to at least make a vegan chocolate to make our list. But these companies make more than vegan chocolates. But So we have a list of what we recommend, what we don't recommend, and we explain why we do and don't recommend these companies. It's also available an app if you have an Android or if you have an iPhone. And it's a free app. We want you to use it. We want you to use this as a tool for social change. And if, again, it would be one thing for us to encourage you to not buy these companies on your own, but we also encourage you to contact these companies. If a chocolate that you love is not recommended by us, say they didn't get back to us, or they're still sourcing from these areas, let them know that you care. Let them know why you're not buying their chocolate right now. We focused on a corporation, Cliff Bar. They wouldn't be transparent about where their chocolate was coming from. So we had to run a three-year campaign against this company where consumers use food as a tool for change. They use their voice as a tool for change. We got Cliff Bar to reveal where their chocolate was coming from and still sourced from those areas. We still don't recommend them. Well, we appreciate corporations acknowledging the power that we have with our food choices. And I'm looking at the clock again. Really okay, so one of the other areas we work on is lack of access to healthy foods in communities of color and low income communities. We're currently doing our work in Vallejo, California. We were asked by one of the founding members of the Black Panther Party to take a look at access to healthy food there, which we did. We found the entire community is void of most healthy foods. Worse, obviously, in communities of color and low-income communities where, um, you know, most of these establishments don't have much, much produce. Majority of the people are getting their food from liquor stores and convenience stores. Where you have 
only a handful of these locations even have any or daring alternatives for the community. Which again, for those people of color who are lactose normal and don't have these daring alternatives to cow's milk, it is a problem. One of the things we found out though, and we're asking all of you to please join us in this, is we found that Safeway had put, uh, they, were, they had a location in downtown Vallejo. They moved from that down location, downtown location, moved to a suburban area. And when they left that location, they put a deed on their former property, preventing any other grocery store moving in that community for 15 years. So for 15 years, that community was void of any grocery stores. So think about it, you're a young person, now you're 15, you've never even known what it's like to have a grocery store in your community, because all you're used to is going to convenience stores and liquor stores. So we corresponded with Safeway, they have not been willing to change anything. So on Tuesday, tying in with World Food Day, we are starting a campaign called Shame on Safeway, where we are going to be launching a petition that we're asking all of you to please sign and share. It's a horrific injustice what Safeway has done to this community. We know this is not the only, only community. We know in Washington, D.C., excuse me, they had to pass legislation to prevent Safeway from doing this again in their community. These aren't just little incidences that have taken place. This is a norm for these corporations, and we have to hold them accountable. For vegans in this audience who don't understand this intersectionality, which hopefully you will, and I'm happy to talk to you more about it, put it this way. If you want more people to go vegan because you want to lessen the suffering of non-human animals, they're not going to be able to do so if they can't access healthy produce. And with corporations like Safeway devastating communities like this, we have to change this dynamic. We need to hold Safeway accountable. We need to demand that they change this unjust and immoral policy that may be legal but certainly is not just and make sure that this changes in communities across the country. One of the other things that we're going to be doing, and um, hopefully you can help us with this too, and this is something that I was unaware of until very recently. I was unaware that many of the LGBTQ community are refused um, foods when they go to food banks many times. And the reason for this is because many food banks are run by churches. And this prevents them from being able to get the foods. They'll look at them and they'll say, no. Or they'll look at them and say, yeah, and then they have to listen to things about how they're going to help. So Food and Power, there's a group called Solano Serenity Center that's getting started in Vallejo with their first food bank. And Food Empowerment Project wants to help them get started. So we're doing a vegan food drive. Last year we did a vegan food drive for the victims of Lake County Fire, which is very close to us. This year we're doing a food drive for this food bank. And again, we have on our website a list of the vegan foods that we will be accepting. So I know I'm close to the end of my time. I want to leave a few minutes for Q&A. A lot of the information I've talked about and a heck of a lot more is available on our website, which is in English and in Spanish as well as we have a website called veganmexicanfood.com, which are vegan Mexican food recipes, also completely in English and in Spanish. And more than anything, I want people to recognize that food is a tool for social change, and we need to wield this tool very carefully and use it with the power that it has. We all make a lot of tough de decisions with our money. We invest in which computer to buy, we make comparisons, we look into different cars that we buy, we make comparisons. We need to look at food in the same way and hold that as a responsibility. Because if we have the luxury to buy whatever we want to eat, there's some responsibility in that. And so I'm asking all of you to look at food as this tool for social change and let's start creating more positive change in the world around us. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> I have a philosophy about boycotts. 
Um, what I, you know what, part of me is like doesn't want this part recorded. Is that okay?